There are few things more rewarding than belonging to a loving family. Christian Assembly Church has been in the community for years. We're made up of a variety of people from many different backgrounds and cultures. Every Sunday we meet together as a church, but throughout the week, there are activities aimed at meeting the needs of kids, teenagers, and adults. You know, at Christian Assembly Church, it's okay to not be okay. Everybody is a work in progress. We're really just everyday people looking to discover and experience the life Jesus promised to anyone who would say yes to following him. Enjoy today's message. Just a few quick announcements. Um, you know, real quick, we like to remind you of the, of the Take 5. You know, we're asking every believer, every, every believer before every service to answer these five questions. Listen, I can't tell you, God presses this on me every, every single week that one of the main reasons we miss the move and the work and the Word of God is because we don't come prepared. My wife sends me to the grocery store and I don't have a list and a highlighter. It's a mess. It's not like I can't throw stuff in the carriage and buy it, but I'll be back at the store. I end up not liking going to the grocery store because I, I'm not ready, I'm not prepared. But when I'm prepared, I have the list and the highlighter and the stuff. I can almost have a good time. So sometimes when we come to church, it's not that God isn't faithful and God isn't good. Our hearts and our minds are not prepared. We get, up, we get up Sunday morning or whatever and the attack is on and by the time you've settled your heart and mind, we're saying amen and I'm asking you to walk out the doors. So this is a simple thing to stop and say, hey, is my heart and mind, am I prepared? I know God's prepared. I know God's not going to miss church today. So these are, just, these are just a suggestion, five things. Take five minutes through your mind and heart. List, God, this is what I'm thankful for right now. And say it, say it. God, Holy Spirit, what do you want to teach me today? I come to be taught. Who do you want me to touch? Who's a person you want me to minister to today? I don't mean physical touch. I mean minister to. Is there somebody I can briefly touch? What do you want to transform in me? Because I know you just don't want to teach me. You're changing me from the inside out. And what's my takeaway? What do I take into the weak Holy Spirit? I'm coming here because... You're, you're moving and working in my life. So I, 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 oh, I admonish you to do that. I know it's not the norm, but I can tell you it's not going away. I'm going to say it till you're sick of it. But it, it, it's changed my worship. It's changed my Sunday. I do it. It's changed. It's changed. So I want to encourage you to do that. Secondly, if, if you're new, if you're a visitor, first time here in a long time, and it's so good, thank you. It's hard with the mask. I really can't see you. Some folks, you pull your mask on them. I don't know who you are. Put your mask on. Oh, I know you. I know your eyes. And, but thank you, thank you, thank you. There are cards behind the chairs if you're a person that needs to get the pen and fill that out. You can give it to an usher on the way out. But we have set up on our app the I'm new. You can click that. Uh, on our church app, and the information's all there. It's just important to get a name and a number, maybe an email to make a connection, especially in these last months. So uh, thank you for being here. If you would do that, we really appreciate it. Next Sunday night also is our Celebrate and Prayer meeting, the 21st at 6.30. I want to invite you, if you haven't come, to come to it. Uh, we start at 6.30, and it's not really a super scheduled time, but it's just a time to worship and pray and cry out together. If my people, which are called by them, my name, will humble themselves and pray, my house shall be called a house of prayer. If we stop praying, we're in trouble. Okay? And uh, two weeks from today, 14th, next Sunday the 21, February 28th, is our annual business meeting. So I'm announcing it now. What a, what a crazy, unique year and, and what to do. So here's kind of what we've done real quick. If you're a member... Uh, I, I, I encourage you to come. We're going to meet Sunday the 28th at 4.30. Uh, we've been really thinking about, because of the pandemic and the year it's been, we want to streamline it. So I'm telling you, unless you make us stay long, I am planning, I've met with the board, we're streamlining, we're going to do just the business at hand, the things we need to do. You know, we need to go over the financial report, let you see that, ask any questions, ratify it. We need to vote for elections, a treasurer and a couple deacons. And we're just going to do the business at hand and we'll pick it up next year. So if you would come, we really appreciate that. We have mailed 
If you have an email and you're a member, please check your email. We sent an email to all the members to say, hey, here's the itinerary, here's what it is, here's the names of people that'll be up for you to vote for. Uh, if you didn't have email and you're a member, we sent you it in the mail. What I call it, the snail mail now, we sent that on Thursday. If you're not a member, I love for non-members to come. If you're part of our family, I love for you to come and check it out. And I know over COVID, we haven't done a lot with membership. I will be on that as we get into March and April. If you're like, hey, I want to be a member. We're going to get to that and tackle that and, and, and do those things. But um, uh, I wanted to just make a plea that you would come. You'd be, prepare and come. 4.30, we're going to start right at 4.30. Uh, and the goal is to be, be done at 5.30, get you out, get you home. We're just going to streamline it, trying to be delicate, knowing, you know, you'll be here in the morning and, you know, just with COVID and all, all the guidelines. So, so thank you for that. Be in prayer for that. You're going like to like the report. You're going to like the report, right? One of the deacons said, right, we are amazed at all that's happened and all the guidelines and all. Someone asked me the other day, how are we financially, right? It's a great question. We didn't make hundreds, yay, millions, but I can tell you God's been faithful. Yes. Lastly, if you haven't downloaded the church app, please do that. Please download the church app. It just, it has everything as we're moving to, you know, whether we wanted to or not. <laughs> 10 months, 11 months ago, you, we moved to online. Um, everything's on there. Uh, you can listen to the messages. You can watch them, the YouTube. All the stuff is on there, prayer requests. You can give. Thank you for those that continue. You're faithful. You're giving. Uh, just really, really been a blessing. Faith promise, everything. If you need help, call us at the office. I've even had a young person or two say, Pastor, if there's some folks that, you know, church app and that stuff is strange to them. They have a cell phone, but uh, we'll get you help, how to download it. And if you have any questions, well, answer. there's no dumb question. Believe me, I'm right in that group that I know enough to get in trouble, but I have teenagers. So I get halfway into stuff, and I go to my teachers, get me out of this. What is this? When do we just, we just had paper before. Where's the phone on the wall? This isn't even a phone. You don't call anybody with it. You don't pick it up when I. Pray with me. Father, as we get to your word this morning, oh, God, pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here with us. If you're joining by camera uh, this morning, uh, I want to say welcome. It's great to see you. I know you're, you'll be watching this on Sunday night. We launch the message out on Sunday evenings. God bless you. Uh, if you're watching and you're a member, check your mail as well and see that stuff has uh, been mailed out to you about the business meeting in two weeks. And uh, I, I say this Wednesday night, I'm going to say it if you're watching, would you share this when you get it? I know it's Sunday night, and uh, if you would like it and share it, and th then you're part of the, uh, the outreach evangelism team. So I want to encourage you to do that. It's great to have you with us. We're praying. I'm continuing to pray that uh, if it be God's will, I, I believe it is, but you know, I don't know it. God's ways are higher than my ways, just to break all this, bring all the rest of the chairs back in and get back to worshiping uh, God and but uh, we'll, we'll let him lead and guide. He is good. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. Hey, uh, prayers for uh, Larry Alfonso. Larry, are you here? Lift your hand. I can't see if you're sitting in here. I don't know if he's sitting here. Or he went on. He's way in the back. Larry's dad passed away a day or two ago. Larry, we love you. We're praying for you. If you noticed, you may not have noticed, but Larry was up here. And this guitar's a little cooler than the one he usually uses. That's, I think that was his dad's. Right, that was dad's guitar, so he's honoring him and uh, praying. He was up in his 90s, but it was still a bit of a surprise. So, Larry, we love you. We're praying for you. Um, amen, 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 amen. Hey, listen. Remember a whole bunch of you, 30 or 35 of you, got together and we videoed you telling your story. You remember that? And New Year's Eve, we had a great New Year's Eve. We came, we just played them all New Year's Eve. And we heard each other, or 35 of us or so, uh, just tell our story of how we were rescued, how Jesus saved us. Well, yesterday began like phase two where we launched them out online. And so we began with one. Where's Lisa? Lisa Messina is here. We started with Lisa. Uh, it was just awesome. It's awesome. So I need every one of you to join the outreach team. You know, on your phone, on your tablet, you can go to the church Facebook page. If you go to my Facebook page, it, um, 
uh, YouTube, the, the church has an Instagram, or when you see it, don't just watch it and like it and put a heart so the hearts go like, <laughs> share it, pass it on to everybody. The goal of us doing that isn't for in-house. The in-house was New Year's Eve, and I was blessed by it again to watch Lisa. The goal at that point is outreach. Somebody out there needed to hear Lisa's testimony of how she came to Jesus. And so what we plan on doing is every Saturday for the next 30 or 35 Saturdays is launching it out. At some point it'll come out. When you see it or when it comes across your tablet or your phone, please share it. So instead of, you know, getting to 100, 150 people, it gets to thousands. So join the, the outreach team. Amen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those of you that are like, oh, I didn't get to share my story, that's not done. That's going to be something we're going to continue uh, to do because everybody's story needs to get out there. The world's asking questions more than they ever had before. And you may not have all the answers, but you have your story of how Jesus rescued you. And that's what you have and that's what you share. Amen? Hey, we began last week um, a journey to help us experience the peace and the rest and the contentment of God. We talked about, you know... Control or content, control or content. I'm telling you, if you sink your teeth into the information from the scriptures, you may experience freedom and contentment like you never have before in a time when it seems it's slipping away more and more and more and more. Amen? This has been our prayer verse, Philippians 2.13. In January, we were playing Romans 12.2, uh, ch transform me by changing the way I think. In February, we're praying Philippians 2.13, God is working in you. Uh, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God is working in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Let's pray this right now, right now, before we begin. Father, Philippians 2.13, I love this verse. It is our prayer for the month, Lord. Thank you that you're working in us. Would you continue to work in us? We give you the right, Lord, to pour inside of us the desire, the desire and the power to do what pleases you that it would bring you glory. Do it right now as we look to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Oswald Chambers said this. Sometimes the Holy Spirit doesn't want to teach us something. He wants us to unlearn something. And I wonder if what we're preaching this February about content and control is more, more to do with this than learning something new, teaching you something new. I wonder if it's, whoa, he wants you to unlearn a way you've learned because you've learned this way in, in order to cope and survive. But God is saying, hey, we need to change this thing. I want you to unlearn it and learn a new way because I want you to have godliness with contentment. Amen? We're, we're moving from the stress of control to the freedom of contentment. But you have to choose it. Last week we saw Peter was a trap to Jesus and contentment was a problem with him because he couldn't see from Jesus' point of view. He couldn't see it from Jesus' point of view. So we saw that Peter's never, this will never happen to you, Lord, collided with Jesus' necessary. This is necessary to happen, Peter. Well, it's never going to happen. Well, it's necessary. And so we saw Peter needed to see it from a different point of view. So we talked about that last week. Sometimes contentment is to stop being stubborn and debate your way and say, Lord, what's your perspective? What's your point of view? Help me let go of control and embrace that. Amen? Here's been our verse that we're launching from all month. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Godliness accompanied with contentment is great and abundant gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment. And I said last week, I want you to experience great gain, great and abundant gain in your life from the inside out. Godliness with contentment. We said the word content right here. The word contentment, in, in the Greek, the language it was written in, it means satisfaction from the inside out, sufficiency from within, a holy satisfaction. The satisfaction comes from the inside, the Holy Spirit, and works its way out. So the outside is the end. You don't need the outside to be a certain way to have godly contentment. There's a holy satisfaction, even if the outside isn't going your way. And I gave you a practical definition for contentment, realizing that God's already provided everything I need for my present and future happiness. So I don't need one more person to agree with me. I don't need one more thing to go my way. I don't need politics to go my way. Thank you for those amens. I don't need it all to go my way. I don't need, I don't need one more thing 
in order to feel God, to feel good, and to feel his happiness. I have my preferences. I like my preferences. When it's up to me, I choose my preferences. But I don't need my preferences to happen to be content. That's what contentment is. Control is this. Control is this. It's when I receive value when it goes my way. I receive value. So I feel like you value me when you agree with me and do what I say. I feel value in church when they sing the songs I want and have the lights how I want them and paint it the way I want and use the version I want. I feel value because I'm getting my way. So I have to be in control. If it doesn't go my way, I don't feel like I'm valued. Okay, it's, it's validation from getting my way. That's what biblical control means. Sometimes you get your way, sometimes you don't get your way. But control means I'm not feeling valued. I've got to go take control so I feel value. Our value is not in getting our way. Our value is who we are in God, who he says we we are, and who he's making us. So you have to dislodge value from preference. If I get my preference, I feel like I'm valued. You're not always going to get your preference, are you? You have to disconnect respect from agreement. If you disagree with me, that means you don't respect me. So i got to take control. I'm not respected. Be careful. If you disagree with me, that doesn't mean you don't respect me. It means you disagree with me. So I'm telling you, these are things you're going to need the grace of God to help you with. But he has said, listen, I have made available for you godliness with contentment. I give you a peace the world can't give. Right? It's a peace that passes understanding. That's the same thing Jesus is talking about. But often we don't, we don't experience it because we have to be in control because that's how we find respect and value and purpose. So before we get to our Bible character today, and I promise we're going to get to him, I want to share something with you that, that our Bible character is going to deal with, but it's, really, it's connected to experience biblical contentment. So please hear me on this. Please, I'm praying as our world gets more and more wild and, and uh, lawless, whatever words you want to use, you don't have to lose your godliness with contentment. As a matter of fact, if you hold on to it or go after it, you'll be a, a, a shining light like never before. Your light will shine brighter. They'll come running to you. How on earth are you still who you are? Let me tell you about him. Right? So... You know me. It's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. What I'm preaching, this is my love. I'm preaching this in love. Even if it doesn't feel it. Okay, so you're welcome. Hebrews, Hebrews 3. I'm going to get to somebody in the Bible that, that um, is just a powerful example. But Hebrews 3, 12 and 14. Then I want to read 19. Here's what it says. All of these messages are on YouTube. They're there for like months. So if you're a note taker, take the notes. I know we even have a place where you can take notes. Even on the church app, you can go and take notes. Um, I had a few other folks saying, Pastor, I was watching the messages from two weeks ago or three weeks ago, and not because they're watching me, but they're like, wow, God spoke a different thing and did a, you know, avail it to yourself. Just avail it. Hebrews 3, be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, that, that's us. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, Turning away from the living God, you must warn each other every day while it's still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we're faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Verse 19. So so we see that because of their unbelief, they were not able to enter his rest. Now, this is a direct, the context is directly talking about the people of Israel, God's people moving through the desert, getting to the promised land, and they didn't get to enter into the rest of the promised land because they didn't believe, and they wandered for 40 years. And that's the original content. But I want to apply it to our lives today because sometimes we say, oh, I know the original, you know, content, uh, where this is put, and then that's all that it means. But although there's one you know, kind of definition, there's many applications to it. You apply God's world to many areas. So you say, well, I'm not in the desert. So listen, he says here, be careful. Your own hearts wrestle with unbelief. Now, I I pray you listen. Because a lot of times when we say this, you would say, that's not me. I believe Jesus is the son of God. He's my savior. So I'm not talking about that right now, okay? 
I'm not talking about Jesus as Savior, but I'm talking about his message of how he wants me and you to live our life. There are many people that believe Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God, but they don't follow his message at all in their life. Okay, so I want you to see this. They don't follow his message of how they should live their life, you know, which, which if, they, if you live your life the way he wants you to live your life and choose his ways and his teachings, and uh, that's how you get godliness with contentment. That's why I'm preaching that to you. So when you say, well, I'm already saved, this just applies for people walking away from God to not be saved. There's deeper applications to God's word. So he said, listen, warn each other, warn each other while it's still warn each other. Well, warning, that's not a fun church godly thing. So, you know, but we need to warn each other because we can be deceived and hardened towards God. That's what he says. Maybe not salvation. There are many Christians that sitting in church this morning saying, I believe Jesus died and rose again. He's the son of God. I believe uh, he crucified on the cross. Amen. But however, I don't, I don't really have a belief and I'm not like getting into his message so I'm not living my lifestyle how he says. I'm not purposely against him but you know, I gotta do what I gotta do. I have the Holy Spirit. He'll lead me and guide me to do what I gotta do. Well, he'll lead you and guide you into God's word. So this is what he says. Rest or contentment can be eluded because we don't believe God's message of contentment. I believe Jesus saved me. Amen. That's not what we're talking about. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There are many people I know that believe Jesus is the Son of God and are not content. And, and live, and their hearts are hard to the ways of God. They say, I believe Jesus died and rose again. I don't know his ways. I'm not really, into, I'm not really following his ways. I mean, you know, that's a, that's a different thing, right? So that's what I'm talking about this morning. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So listen to me. Belief is not experienced when information is known. Because you have information, because you sat through the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount and you have the information of the Sermon on the Mount, that doesn't mean you're experiencing belief in it and the power of it because we experience belief when information is infused into our behavior life. Right? You only experience the power of coming to church not because you believe you should come to church because you have that information, you experience it because you actually Amen. come to church, Amen. right? That's why you were blessed by the worship this morning. That's why, because you come to church. Or if you're watching online, you've stopped, you've tuned in, that's why. That's where belief is. I can't tell you the Christians when, that, I, that I've talked to over the years of pastoring, and I'll begin to share, and they'll say, Pastor, I already know that. I know that. What you're telling me, I know. I let, and I want to say to them, I know that your heart's hard because you know everything, but do you believe it? Of course I believe it. How do you know? B belief is birthed out of behavior, not declaration of your mouth. The behavior of the self, not flawless perfection and performance, but the pursuit of it. So listen to me. The world around us is evil. It's it's unbelieving. And I don't mean evil because the whole thing is like the worst of worst of worst of evil. I just mean the whole thing's evil because the world doesn't follow the ways of God. There are a lot of people that say they believe in God, but they don't follow the ways of God. And so as we come in contact with the, with the unbelieving evil world, we, we listen to me, we argue and we debate and we wrestle with the world, with its words, with its ways, with its wisdom. And when you do that and you put yourself in that boiling pot and you're arguing and wrestling and posting and talking and cutting people off and you're debating and arguing God, it's natural, your heart gets hard. It's natural. It's a natural response to an evil world. It's a natural response to an evil world. So your heart gets hardened. So that's what I want to apply for you this morning from Hebrews. Where he says, we have to warn each other, be careful. Don't let your heart get hardened with unbelief. I believe Jesus is the... I'm not talking about that foundational belief that you believe he died and rose again. I'm talking about the belief of all of his message, the belief of all of his teachings, that that's what you're living by. Here's what Jesus... Because Jesus wants us to have a soft, tender heart humble and meek and lowly in spirit. That's how he described himself, a lamb to the slaughter, right? He wouldn't, even, he wouldn't even break a bruised, bent reed. Do you remember that? It was soft and kind. 
And so here's what Jesus said, Matthew 24, 12. I'm going to get to our Bible character. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So in a culture of lawless living, and by lawless, he doesn't necessarily mean all the laws of society. That's a part of it. But he means lawless where we don't follow his laws, his Ten Commandments. When a culture and a society no longer follows. So a culture of lawless living. Because lawlessness will abound more and more, they won't follow my words or my teachings or they'll say good is evil and evil is good. You know these things, right? So he's saying because lawlessness abounds, what will be the result of that? The love of many, this love is agape love, the love of many will what? Get hard and grow cold because lawlessness abounds. Because we live in a lawless society, we jump in the ring with the lawlessness and we argue and debate and fight and strive and wrestle. We think we're doing it for God. But one of the responses of that, one of the results of that is our hard, our love grows cold and hatred grows. And that's the culture that grows hatred. So you need to stay in your biblical greenhouse, right? I mean, we're not of the world. We live in the world. That's for sure. That's not what I'm talking about. So this is what I mean. In a culture of lawless living, uh, our faith in Jesus saving us can be solid. I believe Jesus saved me. But our hearts grow hard against his teaching. So you're out there in this lawless, hard world, and you just, it's hard, you get hard. Jesus said, be humble. I can't be humble. Not in my world, sorry. (laughs) I believe Jesus, but it doesn't work in my world. Right, when he says be humble. When he says, uh, pray for your authorities. Well, you know, I used to do that, but it's to a point where you gotta be kidding me. My heart grows hard. I'm not praying for that. There's no way I can pray for this and that authority, this and that. See what I mean? I believe Jesus is the son of God. Praise God, amen. But I'm not gonna be humble, meek, and lowly in spirit. I'm not gonna be slow to speak and quick to listen. I'm gonna say my two cents. I'm gonna stand up. I'm gonna fight for my rights and my, I'm gonna, the world's got you then. You won't be content. You might be saved, but you won't be content, right? Honor your parents. That's what it says. Forget that. You don't know my upbringing. This world is crazy. I'm not honoring my parents. Turn the other cheek. Are you kidding me? I duck and wham. I'm eye for an eye in the name of Jesus. You see what happens? You're still quoting scripture. But he's saying, oh, no, you're missing it. No. Remember what he said to Peter when he cut the guy's ear off in the garden? I mean, Peter was like, that's it. We're going for him. And Jesus went, Peter, stop it. Shall I not drink the cup of my father? We're not doing that now, Peter. And I mean, he, Peter did not not love Jesus. He struggled with it, but he had a discontentment. So be careful of your hearts, right? Uh, love your enemies, Go the extra mile. Jesus taught that. Go the extra mile. I'm not even going one foot for them. Lawless, evil, lying, stealing, cheating. So it's Valentine's Day. Submit to your husbands. (laughs) Submit to your husbands. Right, ladies? Are you kidding me? That guy... It doesn't work like that. Maybe it worked 50 years ago. No, no, no. That's what the Word of God says. That's timeless. Maybe the way you do it is different. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and died for her. I'm not dying for her. Yes, you are. That's how it used to be. Not anymore. Your heart will grow hard. Your heart will grow hard. Forgive. Repent. See, these are the teachings. These are the teachings of the man you believe saved you. And so in the world we live, folks, we have an unbelief. They want us... They grow us an unbelief to Jesus' teachings. It affects your ability to live in the rest and the peace of God. And you just become somebody that's out there, a ruthless person that's out there. You just have a different cause. Your cause is Jesus. That's been the greatest stumbling block of what's happened politically in the last 11 months. Not that your information is perhaps wrong, but the world has got you and you're hard towards stuff now and you're not soft and you define people politically. That's been the biggest mistake. And if you're sitting here saying, well, I'm not wrong. I voted for the right person or did the right. You missed it. Your heart is hard. I'm not talking about that. I know there's struggles and trials. I see it happening over and over again in my own life, my own life. The first time I went to pray for our new president and vice president, I, 
I struggled. Not because of anything you might think or like or not, because I know the policies are, are not lined up with the Bible. That's what I'm talking to you about. I'm not talking about the people. I don't even know them well. I'm not really politically. I read the policies. I read the policies. And it was hard. It was hard to come out of my mouth because there was a hardness growing. I needed my preference politically to be content. And God said, okay, now, David, this is going to be, this is going to have to be a move of God. So, right? See these two egg trays? These two egg trays represent just the foundation is the same. Jesus is the son of God. These two eggs, I have one egg here, one egg. They believe the same thing. They come to church here, right? Both these eggs are here today. Mr. and Mrs. Egg, they're here. And the foundation is the same. They believe the Bible's God's word. They believe Jesus is the son of God. They believe all that stuff. However, uh, you know, this, this pot, which represents the world, okay, this is the world. And the world's ways, the, words, the world's words, and the, words, the world's wisdom, say that three times fast, they're all in here in the water, and it's boiling with the world's ways in here, okay? So one of these eggs just says, you know what? I look in there, I see the world, it's not going how I want. I'm only content if the world around me goes the way I want. So this egg jumps in to the boiling water of the world and just is in there debating, arguing, the whole thing, just going at it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And then, but the other egg is cautious and says, hey, you know, uh, it's not going my way. I certainly, some of the heat of the world is getting kind of around me and near me, but I want to be cautious because I don't want the world to transform me and harden my heart at all. So I'm cautious to that. I realize we both have the same foundation. We both have the same shell. We're human beings. And, and so, but I'm just cautious. I can't dive in there and debate and argue and in Jesus' name and, catch it and, and do that. And so sometimes this egg thinks this egg isn't a Christian anymore. But what happens to this egg is when they, when, when this egg comes to church and God is saying, I want you to go to work today and ask forgiveness of your, I want you to call your family member that you screamed with at the holidays and told them they're going to hell and I want you to ask them to forgive you. Because I want you to be, but my information's right. I want you to be humble and meek and lowly in spirit. I want you to follow my way. So when that happens, this egg, here's that, guess what? Right? Because it's been living here for so long, once the shell gets peeled off, it's all said, it's all done, it's hard. It's hard boiled. This egg is saying, God, sorry, this is all I got to offer now. You better work with me. I'm hard boiled and I've been in here for you. You can't mold me and make me. You can't make me scrambled, over easy, whatever. I'm not soft. I'm not moldable. I'm not makeable anymore. This is what I am. Put some salt on me and that's it. God, this is all I have to offer. So God says, okay, well, I'm going to put you in the corner here. You sit there because I can't use you for anything anymore. I saved you, but I can't send you out in the world anymore because you're hard like them. All these eggs are hard on the inside. You didn't fear me and stay humble and meek. It was so hard in Jesus' time. You think it wasn't hard then? It was just as hard. Rome was in charge and they were awful. The church leadership, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were ungodly and awful. Right? So I know it's hard today, but this, so contentment eludes you. Because you come to church and God can't talk to you and mold you and make you and change you anymore. You're all done. The world has stolen what's going on inside. This guy or lady, they were cautious. They're not perfect. They were cautious, humble and meek. They're praying for, a th they're following not just the salvation of Jesus, they're following his message. Humble and meek, lowly in spirit. Quiet, close your mouth. Stay moldable. God, God, whatever you want to do, mold me, make me, change me, transform me. Uh, uh, do inside of me that uh, whatever you want to do. So when this person comes to church and the Holy Spirit moves and God breaks them, well, God can do whatever he wants. It may seem messy, 
but it's not hard boiled. And the world says, and the, the hard Christian says, you're just soft. That's right. Like what? Like Jesus, a lamb to the slaughter, right? Didn't he say, didn't he say to Pilate, I, I could call legions of angels. <laughs> I could just say the word and this is all. My father already drowned everybody once. <laughs> if I say the word, I'm his most precious possession. I don't need anybody down here to debate and fight and win and control anything for me. I am 100% in control walking to that cross. You can be content about that. But I need you to stay soft. So when the time comes for me to break your outside and use you and move and work, I need you for that. Do not get hard. Do not get hard. Hard. Folks, that's what I'm talking about today. Godliness with contentment. It's great gain. So you can love Jesus and believe he died for you on the cross, but, and you can still have a hardness on the inside. The world is training your, how you live your life because you've got to respond to them. They're hard, I'm hard. They yell, I yell. They post this, I post this. They cut me off, I cut them off. In Jesus' name. I mean, I'm cutting ears off every day. Me and Peter, we're just, we're cutting ears off. And I'm telling you, Jesus is looking and saying, don't do it. Humble and meek and lowly in spirit. Control or content. This Christian will lose the contentment of God. They'll lose sleep at night. The anger and the bitterness on the inside hurts your physical body. Then you're praying for God to heal you. And God's saying, well, I want to heal you, but you're so hard on the inside. It's your heart. So, content or control. I want you to, when you see eggs, when you go have eggs after this, when you go to the buffet, no one's going to get hard-boiled. I love hard-boiled eggs, by the way. Love them. They are my friend. But you have to consider this yourself. I meet Christians that are like this. And they, they live in that fire of the world. And they don't know that the world is saying, yeah, just jump in again, yell and scream. Keep doing it because the more you do it, the more you do it, the harder you're getting to the message of God. So when God says, I want you to love them, I can't love them. I just yelled and screamed and wrote a nasty letter and cut them off and said, forget you and forget your family too. And Jesus is going, no, no, I, t I died for them. No, oh no, this is, Satan. this is souls. We don't battle flesh and blood. We did that last month. We are humans, but we don't fight like humans do. We use God's mighty weapons to tear down the strongholds and change ideas and bring people to the Lord. Control or content. Here's today's Bible character. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 13. King Saul, first king. First king, before King David was King Saul. God anointed, God appointed, God had great plans for King Saul. King Saul is lined up. He was a mighty warrior king. He was lined up. They're about to fight the Philistines. The Philistines are the arch enemy of the Israelites. And there was a, there was a, there was a way God had a way. He had a way for them to do things. Like Jesus' teachings are a way we live our life. He had a way. This was his way. The king goes in and leads to battle. He's in charge. But before you go into battle, the prophet priest comes and makes sacrifices. He's the one that does it. The king doesn't do it. The king's son doesn't do it. The prophet priest comes and does the sacrifice. And when they do the sacrifice, right before they go to the battle, it ensures God's presence and blessing and protection. That's what they do. There's a burnt offering or a fellowship offering. And, the, and Samuel was the prophet of the time, the mighty prophet. He would come around and uh, before they would go into battle. Here they're going to battle the Philistines. And the Philistines were strong and big, so the Israelites were nervous. So they're waiting for King Saul is waiting for Samuel to come because King Saul knows the information. Before I go into battle, I need Samuel to come and do the offerings. So we get God's blessing and favor with us. So he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting and he doesn't come. Samuel doesn't come. And it is getting late and it is pressure time and it is pressure cooker time. It's an incredible time and he doesn't come. And so the, the, king, the king didn't say this, I don't care about God. 
I'm going to go to battle. The king said this, I don't know, Saul's not here. Uh, uh, I mean, Samuel's not here. And here come the Phil. We've got to go to battle now. I can't wait anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go make the sacrifice. I'm going to take control. I'm going to do God's uh, teaching my way. I'm going to do what God commanded my way, not God's way. I'm just going to look at the general what he said, but not the details of the way to live. And so King Saul did the sacrifices. That's what he did. 1 Samuel 13, 10 to 12. I pick it up right after the king does the sacrifices that he's not supposed to do. 10 through 12. Just as he finished making the offering. Sometimes, folks, we just don't wait all the... Just let him finish. Be patient. The king just couldn't wait. I mean, he waited a while, but not the whole time. You can't wait. You can't wait to where you drew the line in the sand. You have to ask God where he drew the line. Because if he, you draw it here, but he drew it there. Thank you for those amens. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived to do it. The prophet. And Saul went out to greet him. Because he knows I, we need him. Saul knew the information of God. What have you done, asked Samuel. Samuel saw the sacrifice was already done. What have you done, asked Samuel. I want you to hear what the king said. It's crucial for you today. What this king said thousands of years ago is crucial for your peace today, your contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. This is my prosperity month. I'm preaching great gain. This is what he said. When I saw the men, my men scattering, and you didn't come at the time, we said, and then the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, which was close to Gilgal, which is where they were, the next place they were going to come and invade them. He said, I saw this happening with my eyes. Don't you see things happening? I don't see what I want to see. I saw that happening. And so I thought, I thought to myself, be careful of what you tell yourself. I thought to myself, hey, the Philistines are going to come down and uh, 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 come down against me at Gilgal. I haven't sought the Lord's favor yet. So you see, it was godly in it. I haven't. I saw not good things happening. So I thought, here they come. We're going to start. I haven't sought the Lord's favor, which was Samuel doing the sa doing the sacrifices. Uh, so, so I felt compelled to do it my way. That's not what he said, but he had a, a Frank Sinatra moment. Did it my way. I felt compelled to offer the burnt offerings. King Saul is feeling the pressure of the circumstance. So I don't want to make a joke of this guy. He's in a tight spot. Let's give him credit. This is a tight spot. Sometimes in life we're in a tight spot. Right now the church, Christians, we're in a tight spot. Maybe tighter than we've been in in years before. And King Saul knows God's message. He's not ignorant. He knows. The prophet comes, the prophet does this. Just like you. You know. Maybe not everything, but you know his message. But will he put it into practice when things get tough? Or will he say, well, a lot of stuff has changed, so we don't do that anymore. We don't do it that way. Oh, we love Jesus. But now the king just, he does the sacrifice when he wants. It's just easier. Is it? Is it easier? So listen to me. Unbelief is not the absence of information. It's the choice to behave contrary to the information. So you can, you can believe Jesus rose from the dead and he's your savior and live in unbelief towards his message. That's what happens. I talked about husbands and wives earlier. That's what happens when husbands don't love their wives and wives don't s submit to them and follow the. That's what happens when kids don't honor their parents and fathers don't love their children. That's what happens when we don't. You can say all you want. You think he's your savior. And, and that's great. But contentment and power and the lifestyle that you read about and you want doesn't happen in the salvation, it happens in the following of his message. But we've done this. If I have the information, someone comes in to talk to me, Pastor, this is going on, that's going on. I goes, you know, you need to have a prayer life. I know that. Oh, okay. Well, what are you in here for? I'm having trouble with you're praying, you're reading. I know I'm supposed to read and pray, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Well, that's what I'm here to talk about. 
Because that's where your unbelief is. Your answers will come in following his ways. Titus 1.16, it says this. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. So the world today, for you, brother and sister, what they want you to do, you can proclaim Jesus as your Lord and Savior. They may say, hey, I respect that. But what we want to do is jump in the pot with us because we want to harden your heart to the lifestyle he's called you to live. So you got this kind of Christian that you say, God, here I am, but I'm hard-boiled. That's it. Any other kind of way you wanted to make me today, unavailable. That's, folks, I saw, I thought, I felt. I saw, I thought, I felt compelled to not do it God's way. This is the power why I'm praying Philippians 2.13. Giving God the, the right to give us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. I can't tell you. Well, the culture is so different today. Pastor, it's different today. You, you have to experiment, you know, outside of marriage before you get married with intimacy. It's so different today. No, no, you don't. No, I'll be ridiculed. I'll be a fool. I'll be, no, maybe. That's not the way. That's not how it works. Well, we do marriage different today. God doesn't do marriage different. I do my finances. God doesn't do it different. God doesn't do his word different. Certainly in different cultures and situations, things are different. I'm not talking about, um, you know, the details of it, but the main way you live. Saul should have stood there and said, if God doesn't come, I can't do the sacrifice. So I, I just, Wednesday night, we're reading Queen Esther. She said, if I die, I die. I'm telling you, folks, that's the pressure of the world on you. The world's probably not going to get you to say Jesus isn't your Lord and Savior. They better not. They better not. But they're not done with you yet if we can harden your heart and get you to say you're a Christian, but you live according to the world's ways. There's a hardness. So when you hear godliness with contentment, there's no great gain for you. It's that obedience versus sacrifice thing. Too many Christians are following Jesus my way. I'm following Jesus, but I do it my way. Oh, we don't do it that way. Well, what way do you do it? You don't do, you're not following the Bible's way? And I'm not talking about flawless perfection. You guys know me. I'm not talking about never making a mistake. If you don't do it God's way, you're gonna, you're gonna have the consequences. I say that in love. That's why my passion for all of you is get in the word. Get in the word. Get a word. Pray. Follow his. That's why he came and taught. Jesus taught in detail. He told you how to deal with your enemies. He told you how you want blessings in your finances. Tithe your money. Well, right. no well. Do it. He'll bless your finances. You want him to bless your marriage, men? Go love your wife. Put all your little hobbies and stuff down and stop crying and whining and go ask her how she wants to be loved and love her. Oh, it'll sacrifice and you don't understand. Don't tell me you don't understand. I have a wife. I understand. And ladies, I tell you the same thing. I know your husband's the worst ever. My wife has a husband. You want blessing in your marriage? Go to the Word of God and do it. You don't have to be perfect. He said, if you'll give me a mustard seed. I change everything. You can't say you love Jesus and live your life your way. Every hair on your head is numbered. Every breath you take, he's got. Every detail he wants in on, every single detail. Everything. So let me finish. Let me close. This is what the prophet Samuel said to King Saul after King Saul said, well, let me explain. This is what I saw. This is what I thought. And this is what I felt. Be careful about Living your Christianity on what your feelings compel. Pentecostal Christians make this huge mistake. The Holy Spirit told me. The Holy Spirit told me. The Holy Spirit told me. And then after that phrase, they, they share with me something contrary to Scripture. And I would say, you know, in love, the Holy Spirit didn't tell you that. He couldn't. 
He can only tell you what the scripture wants. That comes out of your hurt, your pain, and your emotion. You're trying to protect yourself, which I understand. I've done it myself. I'm not judging anybody. I've done it myself. I have a passion for this because anytime I have peace and contentment in my life or I wrestle with it with the world, this is usually the issue. It has nothing to do with what's going on around me. It has to do with what's going on in here. And Jesus says to me, you don't need one more thing to change, David, if you want godliness with contentment. And I'm like, well, that's not what I see. That's not what I think. And that's not what I feel. And he's like, I know. That's why it's going to take great faith. Will you follow me even when you doesn't feel? Someone preached this. I loved it. They said, David, your feelings will catch up to your obedience. Your feelings eventually will catch up to your obedience. That's how good God is. It may not be there now. So here's what, here's what the prophet said to Saul when he was done, verse 13 and 14. He said this, you've acted foolishly. That's what Samuel said. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. See, many of us know it, but we don't keep it. You can't just know, you gotta keep. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Listen, if you had, if you had kept it, you would have, God, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all, for all time. Don't tell me God isn't good. Don't tell me God's been mean to this king. God's plan for this king was a tremendous success. For him, his children, his children's children. If you would have kept, the word kept means keep before your eyes and let it be part of your decision life. If you would have kept it, God was looking to establish you forever. God is good all the time. But, but since you haven't, but now your kingdom will, will not endure. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart. So I want you to see that. God is not looking for perfection, flawless living, but he wants someone after his own heart. That's why he went and got King David. And we know King David wasn't perfect, right? He did things that we wouldn't even let him pastor today, right? Pastor John, he'd be tossed out of the assemblies of God. Out, he's gone. And God said, but he's after my own heart. So when he makes those mistakes, he's certainly gonna deal with the consequences of them. But inside, his heart is after me. I mean, he just wants to please me. He's looking and reading and crying out to me. And Saul was a mighty warrior, the potential to be an incredible king. But this is what Saul did. He wanted to follow God like this guy and say, hey, I'll choose who I am on the inside. What I think, what I feel, and what I see, that's what we're doing, God. God said, okay, well, we'll put you here, but I can't use you anymore. I need someone after my own heart. Saul took control when God's word didn't match what he was saying, thinking, and feeling. Saul took control when God's word didn't match what Saul was feeling on the inside. What he thought, what he saw. What God says isn't matching what I'm experiencing at the moment. I need to jump in and take control. And the prophet said, you're a fool. There are many Christians that are foolish, not because they don't know, not because they not have degrees and dark doctorates and they're smart people. They're foolish because they choose their way over God's way. But as long as they just say, I love Jesus at church, they think it's okay. It's, it's not okay. Be careful. We wrestle with unbelief every day. All the more so do you wrestle with unbelief in this world we have because it's more lawless than ever. The laws of God and the ways of God have been thrown out like never before, especially in our own country. So you have to be careful for your heart getting hard and angry and bitter and mad. And you get hard on the inside. And then God comes and says, hey, we need to do this and that. God, I, I want, where's my contentment? Where's my peace? It's like, you've got to let my ways into your decision life. Last week, Peter couldn't, see, Peter couldn't see the situation from a different perspective. Jesus said, Peter, you're seeing like men think. You're seeing it like men see it. You're thinking like men think. I need you to hear my words and see it in my perspective. Then you'll get it. Today, Saul relied on his thoughts and his feelings rather than God's declared ways. Rather than God's declared ways. I know you declare his word. Do you declare his ways? His ways. His ways. That's why he said, Follow me. Follow me. Let my ways rule your decision life. God had great gain for Saul. God had a great future for Saul. 
That's why I can say God has great plans for you, not to, not to harm you, but to prosper you, because it's true. But Saul took control. And I know the situation got hard, and he was in a pickle, but he chose his way, not God's way. Contentment is realized when the pressure is on, we still choose God's message. You still forgive, even though they're unforgivable. You still repent, even though you're like, Ugh! they should repent. You still pray for who's ever your authority, that God be with them and bless them and help them. You still love your enemies. You still turn the other cheek. You, you, you still come to church. You still read your word. You follow his ways no matter what. We have to learn to keep what we know. If you want godliness with contentment, if you want great gain, you have to learn to keep what you know. Saul needed to see that situation has an incredible moment of opportunity. If you're in a, heart, if you're in a Saul moment in your life right now, and what you see and you think, what Saul saw and what he thought and what he felt weren't wrong. That was happening. You're not crazy. You're not crazy. You're right. What you defined as happening is happening. You're not crazy. That's not the issue. What are you going to respond? He didn't ask the last question. I, I, I saw, I thought, I felt. He didn't say, so what does God want me to do? Well, God doesn't care what I do. I'm saved by grace through faith. Remember, we did that. Grace gives you the power to say no to ungodliness and to say yes to God's ways. So you choose his ways. Choose his ways. Choose his ways. Choose his ways. You will have godliness with contentment. You will have a holy satisfaction on the inside. Your life, will, you'll feel like you're born again again. And you won't. You're already born again. The power of the contentment of God, whatever's happening around us, is connected to the passion we have to follow and practice his ways no matter what's happening. Stand with me. I know the hour's late. 